good morning. Happy Lord's Day to you. And happy Mother's Day. I have only a limited amount of Sundays to go through the Benevolence mini-series. So this is not a Mother's Day sermon. Uh, but as we will announce, uh, there are some Mother's Day gifts. There are some Mother's Day activities after the service. So we want to honor the mothers of our church. Uh, but in this sermon, I don't think I use the word mother even once, so just as a heads up. We are continuing through the topic of benevolence, that is compassionate, selfless giving out of mercy because of what we have received as Christians from God, seeking the good of others in tangible ways, material ways, time, energy kind of ways, with a heart that desires to do that, and not out of compulsion, not out of guilt, uh, but really because of what the Christian has in Christ. Not only the example, but also that new life that does delight to pour itself out, out of unconditional love for others, because this is what our master, this is what the creator who we are being remade in the image of delights to do. This is benevolence. We considered laying a foundation how benevolence is crucial to the mission of the church. The mission statement we have in our church is that we are set apart to glorify God by worshiping him and making disciples of Jesus Christ of all nations according to his word. And so we considered how good works, Matthew 5, 16, essential to glorify the Father. Jesus is very clear about that, and this includes benevolence. Pure and undefiled religion, James says in James 1.27, before God our Father is to visit widows and orphans in their affliction, to keep ourselves unstained from the world. So this is crucial to worship, pure and undefiled religion before God. And then as Paul was sent out to plant churches, the apostles charged him, asked him to remember the poor, Galatians 2.10. And he did that. And as we're unpacking various verses, many of them from Paul, uh, we see how he did that. We considered as well what it means to be poor, true poverty, a number of verses that defines that as being without food and clothing. And then we considered the great motive of why to address these things, and that is the gospel as I alluded to just earlier, because our God is a giving God. John 3.16, he so loved the world. In this way he loved the world. He gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And later John takes that, and in 1 John 3.16 to 18, he says, by this we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us. Therefore, we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and the sisters. And so that is the great motive of our benevolence. It brings us to a new topic in this series that this benevolence should be done especially towards one another as Christians. We looked at how it should be especially done towards those who are truly poor but generosity can still be spread abroad to all kinds of people, but it has a particular focus on the truly destitute. Well, similarly, we can be generous and benevolent toward all, but there is a particular spotlight the Scripture gives on fellow Christians, doing it among the assembly of the church toward one another. 1 John 3.16, what I just alluded to, what we went over last week, it uses this same language, talking about how Jesus laid down his life for us. Therefore, we need to do it for the brothers and sisters. John there's using that word, brother and sister, adelphoi, brethren. That is not talking about unbelievers, but believers. Similarly, as we looked at James 2, James 2, James uses the language. If you see a brother in need, he's using that same sibling terminology reserved for Christians only. But to really prove this point, I want to give 
a few texts to really lay that foundation of believers primarily receiving benevolence from other believers. Galatians 6. I want you to turn there. We're going to look at Galatians 6.10 just briefly to see Paul very clearly spell this out. In Galatians, he has been teaching about being justified by faith, but of course that does not leave somebody without works. Works flow out of this kind of saving faith that we are justified by. And in Galatians 6.10, near the end of the epistle, he closes with this. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Notice that there. He's calling for Christians to do good to everyone. But he makes a distinction here. And, he he keeps going, and a different group as well, a more specific group, especially, he says, to those who are of the household of faith. Here's that family language again. Brothers and sisters in a household. Fellow servants under one master. And what kind of household is it? It's of faith. This is clearly speaking of Christians. So yes, there's a, there's a general benevolence Christians should be known for. Being generous and merciful and kind to everybody, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now for some people, this becomes uncomfortable though. They think, well, why is there such discrimination? Why would there be such an exclusivity within the fellow Christian body. What about the unbelievers? Aren't we supposed to do good to them so that they do end up coming to Christ? Well, God never makes that promise. You could give an unbeliever a a billion dollars and put a tract on it, and it doesn't mean you're going to bribe him into the kingdom. That's not how salvation works, ultimately. But what God does emphasize throughout the scripture is that his people, his community should be different from the world. And when unbelievers see this household of faith, they get a glimpse of the good works. Remember Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine that others may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Well, if they see that in a household... It says something about the father of that household. It says something about the master of that household. And it is something that adorns the gospel. As we go with the gospel and people see what kind of family we as gospel bearers are, this is used by God to testify. They don't have that. I remember first coming to Lighthouse and people seemed abnormally happy. Now, you know, you get to know people. Everyone has struggles. I'm not saying that you're happy all the time in some kind of false way. You shouldn't do that. But in my community of people where in order to get drugs, you would freely steal from each other, and everybody knew you were doing that. Everyone knew there was lies going on, and you just had to kind of live with that tension. Uh, Christians should not have a community like that. And I was thankful that as I came to the church... I wasn't seeing that. And when issues were coming up, I was seeing it talked about at least and dealt with, especially as I became a member and was able to help with those things. And that was a testimony to me compared to what I had in the world. And so this benevolence among us is is something important toward unbelievers. But if the household is not standing, if the kingdom doesn't stand, if it's against itself, it's going to fall. If the household is in disarray, who wants to be adopted into that household? Well, Matthew 25 is another key passage which highlights benevolence toward believers. And this is from our Lord Jesus directly. So turn to Matthew, a number of books back. This is one of those passages of judgment, the future judgment. Matthew 25, verse 31 And I'll read it, and I want you to consider 
Who is he talking about here? What language does he use regarding the people who were helped? When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty? or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Very serious passage. But look back up to verse 40, and you will see who Jesus is referring to. He's referring to himself, but he's referring to his brothers, the least of his brothers. He's using that family language again. These are Christians, brothers and sisters of our elder brother, as Hebrews talks about, the Lord Jesus, God who took on flesh And who we now by faith are united to as Christians, as children of God. So this is not only a good passage to demonstrate, Jesus has a particular focus on how we treat each other with benevolence. But really when we do that, it is worship of him. When we do that to the least of our brothers and sisters, we're doing it to Jesus as worship. This was why Jesus called to Saul of Tarsus when Paul the Apostle, before he became an apostle, was persecuting the church. What did he say to Paul? Why are you persecuting me? He was hurting Jesus' followers, and thus it was an offense against Jesus himself. Well, similarly, benevolence to one another is worship of Jesus. So these are some important passages And we could go on, but for time's sake, we'll give you a few to really lay this distinction out. There is a particular focus towards brothers and sisters when it comes to benevolent works. Again, doesn't exclude doing benevolence to others. Galatians 6.10, as you have opportunity, do good toward everyone, but especially to the household of faith. If you are so busy flying around helping others, And yet you're not helping your brothers and sisters in Christ. There's something imbalanced about that. There's something unbiblical about that, according to these verses. Well, now on this topic, we want to see how a model church has done this. Benevolence toward one another. And this model church can be seen in Acts 2, 42 through 47, what Pastor Bud read earlier. So I'll have you now turn there. We're going to spend some time in this passage specifically. 
We're going to see from Acts 2, 42 to 47, that benevolent works help us demonstrate and experience our fellowship as Christians. Fellowship is a big emphasis here. We don't have fellowship with the world like we're supposed to have it as Christians, what we have as a commonality in Christ. Before I read Acts 2.42, I'll read from a, a quote from James Montgomery Boyce and his commentary on Acts. He says of this passage, This describes the early church. It is presented as a model church, but this does not mean that it was perfect. A few chapters further on, we're going to find that it was far from perfect. It had hypocrites in it, as our churches also have. It had doctrinal errors. It certainly had sinful human beings of all types. Yet, it was a model in many important respects. Obviously, this description is intended as an example for us and our assemblies. So to see benevolence among the brethren from Acts 2.42. As we read this again, I want you to pay close attention to qualities of benevolence. Generosity, mercy, giving, sharing. Note this, and then we're going to read an additional passage that will also highlight these things. So Acts 2.42 and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need." And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now I want you to turn just a few chapters over to Acts 4, and we're going to see another summary that Luke gives of the church. Acts 4, verse 32. Also, take a look at these qualities of benevolence. Acts 4, 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that, the, uh, that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So you can't help but start to see the benevolence emphasized in these reports of the early church that Luke gives. Two things in particular came up again very specifically, and it's this phrase that they had everything in common. They had everything in common. 244 and 432 uses this expression. And then the rest of the passage on the material things seems to explain what that means. But let's pause here and consider that expression. The early believers had everything in common. Well, that word common, it's the same word that's used for the word fellowship. Here it's describing how they had their possessions, but elsewhere, the same word in, in different functions, uh, koinonia, it's used to describe fellowship, something that is shared in. It is common because it's not anything special and reserved for only a select few. The idea of fellowship means there's a sharing together of something. Christian fellowship 
is the sharing of the, the Christian life together. Having the same Father, the same Lord, the same Spirit, one baptism, as Ephesians 4 starts to go into, sharing in identities as children of God, sharing in experiences of God's grace that you can speak to each other about. That is the broad Christian fellowship, the shared life believers have together. It's more than a potluck. It's more than talking together. We use that term as Christians kind of broadly, but I usually, if if somebody starts to say, oh, I had some fellowship over here, I kind of know you're using Christianese. Uh, Unbelievers don't generally talk like that. They don't use fellowship to say, I socialized or I I, I met with somebody and we enjoyed company together. We can use it like that. that. That's not wrong to use it. But to understand what's under that, this isn't mere social activity. You're sharing in something together. You're united together by something common amongst yourselves. And this sense of unity in Jesus extended towards how they viewed their possessions, how they viewed their money. There wasn't anything off limits that Christ didn't touch and change about their lives. And that includes their wallets. That includes the way they handled their money and how they viewed their possessions. And so because they had a common faith and salvation and and hope, they shared all those spiritual things, the material things began to be shared too, as well as time, as well as energy. I mean, we didn't just read about giving and sharing of things. There was teaching going on. There was prayer going on, breaking of bread. There's all kinds of things going on there. Well, 150 years later, a pastor named Tertullian wrote about this generosity among Christians. And Tertullian was a pastor in the late uh, 100s, early 200s. He was a pastor in North Africa, uh, which has a lot of Christian history in it. At this time, there was a lot of Christian activity going on in North Africa. Sadly, there's a lot more Muslim activity there now. But God has his people there. And Tertullian wrote a number of things, but in his apology, what, they, what, he's, what is called the apology, he's writing towards the pagans. And he's writing about the Christian faith. Not to say sorry about it. You know, you think of the apology and you're thinking, what is he sorry for? Uh, you might know the term apologetic. Christian apologetics. Uh, This is where we get the word from for giving an answer. So this was Tertullian's answer to the pagans about the Christian faith. A very interesting work. I encourage you to read it more in a maybe modern English if you can find that. But I want to share a quote from him. It's a little bit of a lengthier quote, but it's so fascinating to get a glimpse of, of Christianity in the few centuries after the apostles. So he says here, We are a body knit together. As such, by a common religious profession, by unity of discipline, and by the bond of a common hope. So notice that word, common, common. This is the idea of fellowship. And it's interesting, he goes on and talks about, they they gather for prayers, they gather to sit under preaching and teaching, they gather to encourage each other against sin, to deal in church discipline, uh, things that I'm encouraged that I see Lighthouse doing. You read about somebody from centuries and centuries ago, how they met for church, and uh, it looks a lot like what we're doing. I praise God for that. But then he gets to the point of benevolence. He says that there is no buying and selling of any sort in the things of God. Though we have our treasure chest, it is not made up of purchase money as of a religion that has its price. On the monthly day, so it seems like they gathered money once a month, but he just alludes to this. If he likes, each puts in a small donation, but only if it be his pleasure, and only if he is able, for there is no compulsion. All is voluntary. I'm going to pause here. That's a big point in Scripture. Uh, Lord willing, we're going to go through 2 Corinthians 8-9, through and that's a huge point Paul makes. Nobody is under compulsion by humans to give. It can't be done like that. That's not pleasing to God. And Tertullian notes that here. 
These gifts are, as it were, piety or godliness's deposit fund. For they are not taken thence and spent on feasts and drinking bouts and eating houses. So we need to be careful with our offerings not to do that either. But to support and bury poor people. To supply the wants of boys and girls destitute of means and parents. And of old persons confined now to the house. Such too as have suffered shipwreck. And if there happen to be any in the mines or banished to the islands. Now going into the mines was a form of punishment. So he's meaning those persecuted for the faith. Or shut up in the prisons for nothing but their fidelity to the cause of God's church. They become the nurslings of their confession. So what, was, what is he noting here? Some of the language might be difficult. But he's saying the poor. Uh, those who are orphans, those who are now sickly and homebound, widows, those who are persecuted for the faith, those who face calamities like a shipwreck and they've lost everything. That's where the offerings go to. But it is mainly the deeds of a love so noble that lead many to put a brand upon us. And he's going to quote what he's heard from pagans, a brand, you know, like a a brand that is put upon a cattle by a, a fire poke. See, they say, how they love one another. That's what the pagans were saying of the Christians. See how they love one another. Tertullian could quote them as saying that. That was the effect upon the unbelievers. But then he notes, for themselves, so these unbelievers, are animated by mutual hatred. So what they see in the family of God is different than what they're seeing among their own communities. How they are ready even to die for one another. For they themselves will sooner put to death. And note here what he speaks about the family connection in the household of God. They are angry with us too because we call each other brethren. For no other reason, as I think, than because among themselves... Names of familial affection are assumed in mere pretense of affection. What does that mean? Well, sometimes I'll meet somebody on the street, and I bump into him, and I say, sorry. He says, oh, it's okay, brother. Who are you? Are you my brother? I mean, (laughs) uh, that's a pretense of affection. What brotherly connection do we have? Now, Tertullian's going to say we all come from the same human parents, Adam and Eve. There's a point to that. But some people cheapen that title, brother. The people often don't go around. I don't know if ladies bump into each other and say sister. Sorry, sister. I don't think the ladies do that as much. Us guys have a thing with saying brother. Maybe Hulk Hogan's influence or something. I don't know. But, but he's saying Christians don't do it like that. We're not following Hulk Hogan in this like the world is doing. And they cheapen these terms. But there's something to being a brother and sister in Christ. This is what he's saying here. But then he says, but we are your brethren as well by the law of our common mother nature, though you are hardly men because brothers so unkind. Now, again, if you think that's harsh, you read his apology and he details the persecutions that the Roman Empire was putting on Christians, things that would make you blush. So he's saying you're acting not like even humans. At the same time, how much more fittingly they are called and counted brothers who have been led to the knowledge of God as their common father, who have drunk in one spirit of holiness, who from the same womb of a common ignorance have agonized into the same light of truth. This is what unites us as brothers and sisters. God the Father, one Holy Spirit who's in me and in every Christian here. Though I was born in the womb of ignorance, I was born dead in my sins, yet through various means, he says, the the agonizing, uh, being agonized into the same light of truth, going through various things to now bring me into God's kingdom, as many of you can testify. Now we share that together, and this makes brotherhood sweet. It makes sisterhood sweet. But on this very account, perhaps, we are regarded as having less claim to be held true brothers. This gets a little wordy here, I apologize. That no tragedy makes a noise about our brotherhood, or that the family possessions, which generally destroy brotherhood among you, 
These create fraternal bonds among us. What is he saying here? Well, I remember Pastor Bud, who's done a lot more funerals than me as a pastor. He noted something. He's done funerals for unbelievers, and he's braced himself for a lot of sin. There's a lot of problems when trials come in in an ungodly family. It can rip families apart. Death, health crises, different issues of life can be a test on anybody, but unbelievers are often exposed for the sin that's in their hearts. Now, we Christians can be exposed for those same things, but it should not be so named among us that trials would put a wedge between us. What are trials meant to do? Bring us closer to God. Bring us closer together. And Tertullian is saying he sees that among the Christians of his day. Trials that would break Unbelievers apart bring believers together. Then he finishes here, one in mind and soul. He's using that same language of Acts chapter 4 that we read. We do not hesitate to share our earthly goods with one another. All things are common, there's that word again, all things are common among us except our wives. And then he's going to make a real dig against the pagans. You adulterous bunch. Even your philosophers were immoral and impure. So he is emphasizing this commonality, this benevolence among Christians. And it was a testimony to the ungodly world in the second and third centuries. And it should be a testimony to them today as well. And so we need to elevate this idea of fellowship. We need to lift it up from having a coffee together, though it can be expressed like that, but it's bigger. It's something far deeper than socializing. And because we have this common master, we need to look at everything in our life as being common to one another, ready to share, ready to give, because we are brothers and sisters in the same family of God. Now, We need to go into, though, what this phrase is not. To have all things in common. What isn't it? Because some people throughout history have taken it to various extremes that God has never intended for it to be. What it's not. It's not the erasure or the elimination of private property. But it is a voluntary letting go of property for the good of others in the fellowship. So some have tried to argue for something like communism or some kind of colony because of passages like this. That's the most biblical way to do things. But look back in Acts 2, 45, and Luke describes the way in which all things were held in common by them. I mean, it was an attitude of the heart. But how did it really show up practically? So after he says that they had all things in common in 44, 45, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And there's similar connection in Acts 4, 32 to the end of the chapter as well. Same statement. So they were selling. This is denoting an ongoing activity that was happening at the time. They were selling as in day by day things were getting sold to meet needs among themselves. Uh, Some of you may have heard about the community of the Essenes. They were a Jewish sect in Jesus' day. They were Pharisees, much more familiar with Pharisees, Sadducees. There was different groups. The Essenes were one of these groups, but they were like the monks. They were, they were kind of like the fanatics that left Jerusalem and they lived out in the wilderness. Uh, we have a number of their writings now, the Qumran community, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, they were the ones who had these scrolls. But in order to be one of the Essenes, you had to pledge to give up all rights to your property, and you gave it all to the leaders there. In entering a disciple of the Essenes, You lost everything for the common good. They even use this phrase, to have all things in common. They're using the same phrase there. But that's not what we see going on in Acts. The apostles never make a demand of people. In order to follow Christ, you have to give up everything you own. 
What we're seeing in Acts 2.45 is that there was a regular activity of people selling things, not all at the front end of their entrance into discipleship, but as needs came up, needs were met. And for some of the more rich, those who owned land and whatnot, they decided, I'm going to sell this. I'm going to sell this thing in order to have the money to give to those in need in my church. Jesus commanded selling of possessions in Luke 12, 33. You don't have to turn there, but he says there, sell your possessions and give to the needy. It's something that we then see practiced in the book of Acts. And it is one way in which people can meet the needs of their brothers and sisters. You have things that can profit by selling and you choose to do that, that is pleasing in the eyes of God when done for his glory and for love of the brethren. It was toward the rich young ruler that Jesus made this demand. He told him to sell everything. If you want to come and follow me, sell all that you have. Now, he doesn't call that to everybody. Even in Luke 12, 33, he doesn't make such a strong demand And if you trace this out throughout the book of Acts, uh, going through Acts, Acts 12, I believe, Mary owns a home where Peter ends up coming out of prison and he goes to Mary's house and they've, they've gathered there praying. Why does she still own a house? I thought she was supposed to sell everything. Well, no, we don't, we don't see that. We don't see every single thing being sold by believers. But that rich young ruler, Jesus knew the one thing he lacked This man was righteous in his own eyes. He thought he kept all the commandments. And Jesus knew the question. He knew the demand to expose this person's sin. And so he says, go sell everything and follow me. He hit him right where it counted. And that man's grip was too tight on the things that he had. And so he walked away sorrowful. Well, we're going to be challenged by this too. We might have too tight of a grip on our possessions. And individually, Christ will come and call us to part with certain things for the sake of loving others, for the sake of following him. But it gets at that heart, and we're going to visit that coming up here in the sermon. But suffice to say, private property was retained. This is not communism. Uh, Private property is enshrined throughout the Bible. Go back into the Old Testament. Thou shalt not steal. What's implied in stealing? Well, you're taking something that doesn't belong to you because it belongs to somebody else. And that is part of having private property. Well, what else is it not? It's not something compelled to do under pressure from man. But this benevolence was freely given because of God. And as you read these accounts in Acts, it was clearly voluntary, clearly part of being devoted to the teaching and the fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayers. Uh, Acts 4.32, being united, being of one heart and soul. There There was a love, there was a reality of the gospel in these people's hearts that motivated them to to freely sell these things, to share these things, to give these things. It wasn't Peter and the apostles guilt-tripping people into doing it, demanding people did it, like the Essenes. In fact, skip over to Acts chapter 5, and we see a couple who sell their things in order, it seems, the strong indication is it seems to look good in front of the rest of the church And God calls them out on it in a big way. Acts chapter 5, But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds, and brought only a part of it, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And notice Peter's response to this. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. 
So there was deceit going on. There was hypocrisy going on. In contrast to Barnabas, who sold everything and gave, this couple wanted to look good as well. And instead, they were exposed as hypocrites. But notice Peter's word there. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? Nobody was asking Ananias and Sapphira to do that necessarily. Nobody was forcing them. It was their property. And then he goes on, And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? He had the choice to give what he wanted to give. Nobody was forcing him to give everything or to lie about giving everything, especially that. And so here we see that a hypocritical motivation is not pleasing to God. And just like uh, Nadab and Abihu were burned by the Lord in Leviticus as the old covenant was inaugurated, they, they offered strange fire and they died before the Lord. So here under the new covenant, two people offer false worship to the Lord and they're made an example and they die you keep reading, both of them die for this. And so real motivation has to be love for the Lord, unconditional love, selfless giving, joyful, cheerful giving, not something to please others. Again, James Montgomery Boyce, the early Christians shared their possessions, not because they were communists or socialists, Not because they were forced to share their things, and that's what he's defining communism and socialism as. You're forced to share your things. But for a far better reason. They shared their goods because they were generous. And they were generous because they had learned generosity from God. God had been generous with them. So because God had been generous with them, they were determined to be generous with one another. That's it. That's the motive. What else is it not? Well, the goal is not to help believers build wealth, but it's to address true poverty. Notice that here in both passages, I'll just point you to 245 at the end of that sentence there. The proceeds were given to all as any had need. That phrase, as any had need, is highlighted in both passages, and it's important It speaks to what was going on as well in the early church. At Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, you had thousands of people, thousands of Jews, who had traveled in for the Passover and then staying for uh, the feast of uh, for Pentecost. And now they came under conviction of sin and decided to give their lives following Jesus. I'm sure some of them left earlier than others, but on the whole, many of them said, ah, my trip has become a lot longer. I didn't expect this. (laughs) So now you have thousands of people, maybe they've only budgeted for a certain amount of time for these festivals, but now they're sticking around to learn, to get strengthened as new disciples. And so what did the church have to do? They had to step up to meet needs. They didn't have the food and the shelter and the very basic things of life. It's like going to another country and you overextend your stay and you didn't account for that. Well, what are you going to do? You, you need help from people now. And this is where the early church stepped up. They gave their help. In fact, they sold things in order to help those in such need. So this is the principle to be applied toward other believers. We've already talked about true poverty, true need. That's the primary goal of benevolence or the focus of benevolence, and we see that coming out here. But Paul will later call Titus to keep teaching the church this. The end of Titus, Titus 3.14, Let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. So urgent need unexpected things that happen in believers' lives, and now they don't have what they need. Uh, Think of what's going on with these fires to the north of us. If you had the opportunity to do something to help people in that situation, 
You know, we should pray, God, give me this opportunity. Help me consider how I can do this. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate that. So we need to be ready to meet cases of urgent need. And so ready as the early church to do radical things sometimes to do that, to meet that. Uh, Acts 4.34 shows the effect of that early giving. So between Acts 2.42, the first passage we read, and then Acts 4.32, you have a period of time, you have persecution beginning, you have some things in between those chapters. But now notice the testimony here in verse 34 of uh, chapter 4. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. So there was not a needy person among them at this time. Those needs were met to the glory of God. For this time, as we keep reading Acts, and there becomes new needs. That's just the nature of of our fallen world. But here you have a glimpse of the glory of God's people. Uh, There are writings from Greeks who viewed sharing all things in common as one of the greatest ideals. Uh, Plato in his uh, Republic, I I tried to read that in the past and my head got so dizzy I just had to put it down and I I can't handle philosophy. I don't know if you like philosophy or not, but uh, Plato advocates this. He's saying, no, no, everything should be held in common together. You need oligarchs. You need a government to to do this, uh, so now you're getting into communism or another bad system, so don't, don't follow Plato. But that was kind of the ideal among the Greeks and the Romans. They, they did like the idea, not really of capitalism, but more of a equality distributed among each other, so everybody had what they needed. And here, Luke is saying there wasn't a needy person among them, not because of a forced generosity, but real generosity. The Greeks would have lit up at this. They would have thought, wow, the the church is embodying some of that. They're helping each other to that degree. Well, as well, the Jews would have lit up at this too, that there was no needy person among them. Think back to Deuteronomy. And what was one of the promises God gave to Israel if they obeyed him in the land? Well, specifically, Deuteronomy 15, verse 4 He says, there will not be a needy person among you on the condition that Israel obeyed the covenant. Now, that wasn't the case. So there was a lot of poverty. But under that old covenant system, the elimination of poverty through God's blessing, the blessing of obedience, was something that now you got a glimpse of in the church. Not under the old covenant, but now in the new covenant with the Spirit of God encouraging generosity to meet those needs. So, again, going back to the bare bones mission of the church with benevolence, it's not raising people's living standards up to a level that we think is good. Now you have a good life because you have X, Y, and Z, and your conditions are such and such like this. But it is meeting those real needs, food, clothing, sharing, doing what is needed to ensure none of us are destitute in our assembly or in the larger Christian community as we have opportunity. Is there discipleship for financial stewardship and wisdom and and growing in those things? Yes, of course. But, But that's not the same thing as what we are commanded to do, to give to the poor, the baseline benevolent work of the church. So finally, one fourth thing, what this is not, holding all things in common, what it is not, it is not above teaching God's word or separate from preaching God's word. It flows from this gospel ministry, but it should never overshadow gospel ministry, making of disciples, planting of churches. Note that these descriptions 
of benevolence are tucked away amidst a bunch of other things going on. I'll turn your attention to Acts 4 again. Look at 4.32. This is the opening statement, and it finishes at the end of the verse. They had everything in common. And then he, Luke cuts in verse 33 with this. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. And then verse 34, there was not a needy person among them. And he goes back on into a benevolence focus. Well, in the middle of that, you see the apostles. What are they doing? They're preaching the gospel. They're testifying of the resurrection of Christ. Luke isn't seeing two compartments here. He's not seeing different programs. He's not seeing a sharp division between these activities. This is all part of a healthy church. This is all Mark's of a genuine New Testament church. And so we're reminded here not to let the church drift into a humanitarian work focus, not to testify of the resurrection of Jesus because we don't want to offend people. Let's first fill their bellies and soften them up to it. It's the wrong thinking. Jesus preached and he did some good works, but he turned around in John 6 and he says, you're following me because of the bread. And he was willing to call them out for that. But he did both. But one has primacy over the other. Preaching, teaching, making disciples through sharing the word of God has to take preeminence. We cannot drift from that. But that should not leave us a church that only loves in word. Deeds are necessary. Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, he has this quote, Works of charity must keep pace with the preaching of faith, or the church will not be perfect in its development. What he's saying there is we will not be a mature church. We will not reflect God's heart. We will not be Christ-like. If works of charity, benevolent works, do not keep pace with the preaching of faith. I like that expression. Here's the preaching of faith running ahead, but... Good works should be very closely behind it, should keep pace with the preaching going on. If there's preaching and preaching and preaching, but no genuine fellowship, no benevolent works, there's something wrong there. Is the word of God truly being heard and done, as James 2 warns us about, James 1 and 2 warn us about. So this is important not to drift from the preaching of the gospel, but also not to neglect how clear benevolence was in the early church. Luke did not shy away from emphasizing this, along with the preaching of the word and the prayers. So as time progressed, the church had to respond to issues of need. We don't have time to go into this, but you keep going forward through the book of Acts. Acts chapter 6, the widows who needed regular support from the church, there was problems, And so the birth of deacons happens in Acts chapter 6. That's how I would interpret it. The elders of Lighthouse would interpret it. Not everybody interprets deacons starting in Acts 6. But I do believe there's good grounds to argue for that. So, you know, again, the apostles had to get other laborers involved, godly people. They had uh, enrollment for widows who had no other means of help. Again, the truly poor, 1 Timothy 5 Paul's later going to really spell that out for Timothy. So it develops further in the church. We have also in Acts chapter 11, there was a famine that comes upon Jerusalem, or it was coming upon Jerusalem. One of the prophets warned the church in Antioch ahead of time. So a separate church. There's a famine coming. And so what did the disciples in Antioch do? They started to gather their resources and they sent it to Jerusalem to help out another church because of a natural disaster that was coming. So you start to see churches working together, different local churches working together to address major needs like famine and so forth. And that special offering for the poor in Jerusalem, so many passages this fills up. Romans 15, the end of 1 Corinthians and 16, 2 Corinthians 8 through 9. Acts 24, Paul's there alluding to why he came back to Jerusalem, to give this 
uh, money to the poor. And we're going to explore that, Lord willing, uh, in a few weeks. So this doesn't speak to everything the church ends up doing. But this is the beginning. And this really is some of the heart. This is the stuff by which generosity and benevolence begin to flow. But I want to finish with a few things here that will help us really put practicality into this. One fellowship with one master, one God. The scriptures use language to describe this unity that we have and how benevolent works should be operated in within this unity. We're called to be generous and to do benevolent works. All of us are. But there are some within the fellowship who are particularly called to be generous and to do benevolent works. And I want to give you three passages on that, and then we're going to close. So those who are particularly to be generous, let's start with Romans 12. Romans 12, 3 through 8. If you've been with us for the evening services, Pastor Bud, last few Sundays, has been going through Romans 12, really looking at the consecrated life. Well, after the first two verses, we read about some of the ways that that dedicated life to God should be lived. Got to make sure to use Lincoln's water, not mine. Honor what he did for me there. So Romans 12, 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members or body parts, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. So let me pause there. This is the illustration of the body, the unity in Christ, the commonality we share as a body. Different members are different body parts. Again, the word member, you hear that in our church. We're not talking about a club member. We're talking about a part of the body. You have come, Lord willing, we'll hear these testimonies. You have shared with the rest of the assembly, I am a Christian. Here is why. I know the gospel. I'm following the Lord. I want to follow him with you. First into the waters of baptism, and then after that, day by day, week by week in this particular assembly. That's the heart of membership. Well, here we have that commonality as a body, but different giftings. Verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation. Now note this. The one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So much like all are called to be generous, the scriptures know there are some in the assembly that will be given by the Holy Spirit desires, giftings, empowerment to be particularly generous, particularly merciful. This is one of the ways that you will glorify God. You will worship God. You will build up other Christians to be more like Jesus. It's through that generosity. Again, that doesn't exclude people from not being generous. Oh, that's not my gifting, so I'm just not going to do that. That's not what's being said here. Because you could go through all those other things, and in a way, we're all doing that in a general way. But there are some among us, I would be confident to say, that you are gifted in this way to contribute. You are gifted to do acts of mercy. Now you need to do it, as he says here, with generosity. Fight those selfish desires. Fight the stinginess that is so prevalent in our culture. Fight anxieties and fears about this or that. What if, what if. But glorify God in your contribution. And same with the act of mercy. I would call this under benevolence too. Acts of mercy. Do it with cheerfulness. 
You want to be merciful to others. You want to visit the sick. You want to help the weak. Sometimes they bite. Sometimes you'll take on some of the sickness that they have, so to speak. You're visiting all the sick and you end up not feeling good. Well, you need to maintain a cheerful heart. Because in all of your serving, if you get bitter, God doesn't want that. That's not, that's not how he wants you to use your gifting. So here we have the evidence. Those who are called with this gift ought to use it in this way. Benevolence works like that in the church. Turn over now to Ephesians 4. This one's a little bit maybe more of a surprising one. It sure surprised me when I first learned it. Ephesians 4. Again, Paul talks about the commonality in the church. One faith, one Lord. He opens up four like that. He goes into the body illustration throughout the chapter. He's talking about the body. But then in verses 22 through 24, he's talking about the new man being transformed by the renewing of your mind, by putting off the old man, verse 22, and putting on the new man. So very similar to Romans 12, actually. And then in 25 onward, he shows Christians how to do this. He's going to look at various different kinds of people. How do you put off that old behavior? How do you be renewed in the spirit of your mind? And how do you start living more Christ-like? Notice what he says in verse 28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So if you used to steal... If you are a former thief, now I'm not talking about taking your, the cookie from the cookie jar from your mom. I, I don't think we're all guilty of that, sadly. That is thievery. That is stealing, yes. But I don't think that's what Paul's getting at here. You led a lifestyle of stealing. You, you premeditated ways to get stuff without paying for it, taking what didn't belong to you, whether it was from a store, from another person. This was something that characterized you. Okay, you're supposed to put that off. We know that. You sh thou shalt not steal. But what Paul's getting at here, how do you put that off, Christian? Be renewed in your mind to become generous. Be benevolent. Stop being a consumer and a taker and start being a giver. A thief stops being a thief, not simply when he stops stealing. You know, when, hopefully you weren't stealing while you slept, you former thieves here, right? There's times you're not stealing 24-7, but a thief stops being a thief when he becomes a giver and a hard worker. He produces something to help others. He's not taking what's not his. And that's what Paul's getting at here. Get to work, you thief. <laughs> you former thief. Put that away. Work in order to share, do honest work in order to give. And by this, you will be transformed more and more into the image of Christ. You're blessing other people, but that's one of the, the ways God will sanctify you. I was a former thief. I am a former thief. I made it a practice of stealing. I even had my own justifications for it. I'll steal from Walmart, but not a mom and pop store. Because I'll be like Robin Hood, right? doesn't matter. <laughs> it's stealing. It's wrong. And I've had to take this to heart. Okay, this speaks to me. How then can I grow in Christ's likeness? Well, one of the ways is going to be I need to become a generous person. I need to become a hardworking person so that I have something to then give to others. If you're a former thief here, this verse is for you. If you have trusted Christ and you want to grow, this verse is for you. So it's those gifted in the assembly, and it's, it's those former thieves who need to grow. Uh, one more, and then I'll close. Uh, 1 Timothy 6. We'll, we'll do this one quickly, because time is fast escaping us. 1 Timothy 6, near the end, 6, 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They, that is the rich in the assembly, are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, 
thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So notice Paul's appeal here. People who have an abundance of money and material, this is the stuff of life that the world calls life. You got a lot of stuff. You're, you're coasting because, wow, you got it made materially. Paul says that's not truly life. Take hold of what is truly life by being rich in good works. Use what you have for the glory of God, for the good of others. And that translates to treasure in heaven. Matthew 6, Jesus calls us to do this, to lay up treasure in heaven, not on earth. How do you practically do that? Well, one of the key ways, I believe, is by being generous with what you have in this earth. You're not going to get to keep what you own after you die. But as Randy Alcorn says, you can send it ahead. Meaning, what you do with your wealth, your possessions here, if in a godly way, it's an investment for future reward in heaven. If you try to hold on to the things, you're not going to bring it to heaven with you, but you use it in a way that's pleasing to God, it translates to heavenly reward. And that's what Paul's getting at here toward the rich, those who have things to share. So, those are some practical things of how Christians do benevolence toward one another. And we're all called to do this. We need to consider if and how we are to do it, just as those specific passages give us. But also to consider what Jesus lovingly said to that rich young ruler. He was able to get at that young man's heart and point out the place of discomfort, of anxiety and idolatry in following the Lord. And God wants us to learn from that. What do we have too tight of a grip on in the material world? And how can we better use it, view it as common for use among all of our brothers and sisters, and be ready to part with it if it means meeting the needs of another? This is what God wants us to grow in. And this is what we see from the early church. Now, if you don't know Jesus Christ personally, you can do that until you don't have a dime to your name, and you will not enter heaven by doing that. We, again, are to do this because we are rich in Christ. And if you're not rich in Christ, if you don't have assurance that you're on your way to a heavenly place with him, streets of gold, which pale in comparison to any material things we have here on this earth, If you don't know that you're truly forgiven, you can't calm your conscience by just starting to be generous. You need to go to Christ personally. You need to confess your selfishness. Confess what you've stolen. I think of you children right now. Some of you children have already been guilty of taking things that are not yours. Have you talked to Jesus about that? Have you confessed your sins and said, Lord, forgive me. Be merciful to me, a sinner. He died on the cross for our failures, for our sins. And by trusting in him, we can have eternal life. And from that, we should day by day be growing in that joy of together glorifying him through good works. So let's pray that God helps us do that. Oh, Father in heaven... We thank you for the example that you do give in the early church. It is written for our instruction so that we would follow in their steps as they followed Christ. Help us, O Lord, to know how we each can best do that and how we can do that as a church. Help us indeed elevate that term of fellowship that we really would feel within our hearts that connection to one another not because we share in uh, worldly interests or because we have personalities that are like, but something far deeper because we have the same Father. We have the same Holy Spirit. We have you as our master. And help us then love one another 
by doing good, by meeting needs, by stepping forward in the ways that you want us to, to do that. We pray, Lord, that you would get glory out of our church in this. And for any here who are without Christ, may they see, Lord Jesus, what you've done for them to make them rich in you. May they see their poverty, their spiritual debt and bankruptcy, that their sins owe a great debt against you. But you came to forgive them, to cancel that debt and credit them with righteousness that they could never live out themselves. May they place their trust in you before you would return and judge the sheep from the goats. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.